much. I will turn on this microphone here, even though it may be save my voice, I guess. Oh, okay. uh, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, so it's a small group, and uh, you know I have slides, and I'm happy to go through all the slides. I'm gonna probably take 40 minutes or so, but it's always more fun to kind of answer your questions and make sure that uh, you know I help help uh, make this uh, time here as worthwhile as possible. <laughs> uh, and uh, at any point, you know, feel free to raise your hand, you know, ask me a question. I, I really would uh, rather. I'm happy to be interrupted, and I can speak through, through some slides. And uh, it, even if there are things that people really want to fo want me to focus on, talk about, I'd love to hear sort of right now, so that I can make sure that, that I can focus on those things during the talk. Is there any specific areas that people want to hear about in particular, just broadly? I'm not sure if we have individual questions. Yeah. Well, how? Um since I've heard of this disease, I've heard it's uh, somewhat pro-inflammatory or involves inflammation. Mm -hmm. And how, I'd like to try to understand how that might impact the presentation, uh, especially with respect to how your own body's uh, okay. systemic inflammation might impact. Okay. Okay. I'll see if I can answer that one. What about how to interpret the flow cytometry? Like how to do that calculation okay. around so that you can uh -huh. graph it and understand it? Good question. <laughs> I was asking the doctor earlier about uh, flow cytometry versus gene rearrangement. Uh, I was diagnosed with Cesare using flow cytometry, but I recently had gene rearrangement done. I have no idea what gene rearrangement means, and so I was asking him to explain what the difference is for, from a patient's standpoint between flow cytometry and gene rearrangement results. Okay. Good. So those are... Oh, yeah. When you talk about treatments for aggressive, better to understand for an advanced stages, meaning advanced stages, meaning uh, as you talked about downstairs, if you've been stable for say almost two decades, they're never been a remission, and you start to see things in places that you didn't see things before. Mm -hmm. What? Because you at the very end you talked about what should trigger looking deeper than yep. just the visual and, sure. and the complications caused by it. You said steroidal, you know, they can give you yep. a, a cream like to use. Okay. Those are all good questions. I'll uh, kind of weave that in here. So. Yeah, I know those are all good things though. Yeah. I'll try to touch on uh, some of the, a lot of those questions I think I can probably answer in the beginning of the talk. Uh, most of the talks kind of mainly focused on really treatment treatment uh, modalities, treatment options mm -hmm. for the advanced stage patients. But I initially talk, I'll talk a little bit about some of the diagnostic things uh, which are pertinent to, I think, a lot of those questions that, that we just mentioned. Just to give everybody a broad, you know, 10,000 foot view, uh, so lymphoma being a blood cancer, uh, and broken down to these big different subtypes, Hodgkin, not Hodgkin, and based on the cell that's affected in the body, so there's the different families of infection-fighting cells in the body, whether they're B cells or T cells or NK cells. We're really focusing on the T cells here. And then you can have kind of indolent, aggressive forms of T cell lymphomas, or T cell lymphoproliferative disorders. There are a number of slow-growing or indolent T-cell lymphoproliferative disorders here. Um, and the vast majority of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas are indolent diseases or slow-growing, things that, that, again, you know, we don't cure, uh, but that's something that um, often you know, people don't die from. And then there are aggressive uh, types of primary cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, or at least uh, scenarios where it's aggressive. And that's probably about 20% of the time, so it's a small, small group of people that, that where it's more aggressive. There are other subtypes, just to point out, and this is why initially we get a lot of that initial workup uh, with CAT scans or PET scans or some of these uh, other techniques, other blood assessments to rule out that this is a different thing, that we're you know, on the right track for the right disorder. Um, so really what I'm focusing on is this portion of people that are primary cutaneous T-cell lymphomas that are a bit 
more aggressive or failing kind of initial uh, initial topical therapies, <clears throat> which is kind of the focus of really this uh, talk. Uh, if I'm not offended, if you if you don't want to hear about that and you want to leave and go somewhere else, that's okay. But I'd rather you be in the right spot and get the right information. But this is really who we're focusing on here, the people that uh, need systemic therapy or that have kind of these aggressive uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Um, so this kind of uh, talks a little bit about um, this, this is staging. I know I only have two slides here about staging because I, I spent a lot of time on it in the, the last session. Uh, but the staging of mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, which are the, really the chunk of what uh, most of we'll talk about, um, involves these evaluation of all four compartments. Um, so it's not just looking at the skin or the lymph nodes or the, or the vis or visceral organs. That used to be the staging system in 1979 that included only these three portions. So just look at the skin, looking at there was organ involvement, rarely people can get like lung involvement or other sites, uh, or if there's lymph node involvement. Then in 2007, we incorporated blood involvement, and probably maybe less than five years ago, we had developed different techniques on how to assess for blood involvement, so it's made things much more complicated. And uh, this is the blood involvement, is where we get into questions about like looking at the if, if looking for a T cell, that same T cell clone that was in the skin with molecular studies, if we can identify it in the blood and do identify it in the blood, just how important is that to the overall prognosis, treatment, etc. Uh, and the short answer is we don't know, <laughs> but but that it, there are at least lot there are lots of people with early stage disease that have very very small amounts of blood involvement that do very very well in terms of in, you know and don't have any worse prognosis for having that small amount of blood involvement. Uh, so I think that's a, a you know kind of a key point to uh, to to remember because people often get real. Um, Inappropriate, not inappropriately so, but often get real scared or kind of when people tell them they have blood involvement of their lymphoma. Um, but now, because we have these really not good tools, uh, with this being a blood cancer that goes to the skin, we're now able to pick it up in the blood with much better sensitivity than we used to. Uh, so it's more of a testing, um, our testing's gotten better, and now we're able to, to identify it now but doesn't necessarily impact how we can treat it or long-term prognosis. Uh, so this T, uh, like I mentioned before, we have this TNMB staging, with the B being the blood, and uh, T being the like skin, and depending on how much skin is involved, or depending on if you have uh, you know, people that have this T1 or T2 stage, and none of these other things, and maybe only small amounts of blood, really get treated as early stage, or are what we will classify as early stage disease. And typically can be treated really well, and put into remission with just topical or phototherapy, or skin-directed therapies. But individuals with these what we call tumor lesions, or people that are red, erythrodermic, erythrodermic from head to toe, those are more advanced stage diseases, and often need more aggressive types of treatment. Uh, people with high amounts of blood involvement, and people with lots of lymph node or other organ involvement, which is pretty uncommon, also need an aggressive treatment. So like, if you're you know, drawing a line across who needs, who is considered advanced stage disease or who needs aggressive treatment, it's everything kind of below, below T2 on down, with the exception that only people with high amounts of blood involvement really would classify as advanced stage disease. Um, does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. Go ahead. So I think what I'm hearing, aside when I look at the blood, yeah. Last time anybody looked at the blood means 1999. Yeah. <laughs> so does that? Should I have a look? At yeah. Again, given I'm having issues, or so usually you know? if if what I say is that you know what happens is that the skin often reflects what is going on in other places in the body. So if your skin's not doing well, or it's progressing on therapy, or not responding to therapy, it's probably worthwhile reassessing the blood. 
Um, and even reassessing, you know, sometimes we'll do repeat CAT scans and things like that, it's really progressing. Um, but if things are in remission, doing well, um, you know, there's no real reason to go digging deep into the blood to see if there's any small amount of it. This isn't a, it's not a, a cancer that we think that we're curing. So likely, when we detect these small amounts of blood that are in, there are small amounts that are in the blood, um, they probably have been there for years and will be there for years and not really cause any problems. Um, so just to, just to know, just to know is, um, it's not, it's not, it's unclear that, that we should do that, just yeah. to know. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, go ahead. Quick question. Um, so, I'm trying to understand this cancer is a blood cancer, um, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it might not exactly have blood involvement, so I'm trying to understand it's a blood cancer, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, all, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question, and it's often, uh, so the, it's a blood cancer because the cancer cell is from the blood system. So it starts, you know, all of our, uh, all of our uh, blood system and lymphatic system is composed of different kinds of infection-fighting cells. So you have these myeloid, this myeloid family, which is like your neutrophils and some other ones, and then you have lymphocytes or lymphoid family. The lymphoid family is composed of B cells, T cells, and NK cells. These are all cells that are really made in the bone marrow uh, in adults and kind of long bones in our body. Those cells, when they start, when they grow up and become adult lymphoid cells, they travel to different parts of the body. And for whatever reason, somewhere along the way, one of those T cells, when it's growing up and becoming an adult and traveling to lymph nodes or traveling to skin like they usually do, kind of became a cancer cell. And so that's a blood, the blood that cell, which is part of the blood system, has become a cancer cell as it's grown up and become an adult, and honed and gone to the skin. And it's just sitting in the skin, um, and sort of at least tucked away there as a larger uh, group of them. <laughs> there may be, you know, there, there, there are probably as our technologies continue to get better, we're probably going to find more and more patients without blood involvement have some small amounts because of this. Uh, as our technology gets better, it's just that our technology is not really good enough to find those kind of minute amounts of the, the cancer cells. Does that make some sense? Yeah. But it's a great uh, point and it's a difficult point to uh, Understand. <laughs> uh, this just this is uh, when we talk about advanced stage disease and people who need systemic treatments. Uh, we're really talking about people with stage two B and beyond. Um, to have <coughs> stage two B and beyond, that's people with tumors. So these are the round raised lesions, greater than a centimeter, uh, lymph, significant lymph node involvement, visceral or organ involvement, and significant amount of blood involvement. I'm just kind of emphasize that. You know, just a small amount of blood involvement does not make you advanced stage disease, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. And if you're red from head to toe, that makes you advanced stage. These are just the pictures that I showed before, where we talk about this is early stage disease on your left, the patch and plaque stage disease, and on your right, these are advanced stage diseases, and often more aggressive treatment. The reason that, you know, we think that this might need more aggressive treatment because it's, you know, can even encompass less than less body area than say some of these patches or plaques, is that when you get to this stage and you have a tumor lesion, and it's kind of involving usually from a plaque, even sometimes the tumor stage, that the lymphocytes, while they're still growing outward and causing this lump, they're also growing deeper too as well. And those it can progress and go other places and, and um, cause problems. So of course, even with within advanced stage disease, there are uh, lots of factors that, that affect um, you know prognosis and how people will do. Um, you know, and, and we don't really have great tools yet. We're still trying to get better better tools and better um, a better way to characterize the disease and, and to better um, identify who should get more aggressive types of treatment because. You know, one of the things that we mentioned is uh, a, a goal in continuous T-cell lymphoma is to do no harm. 
Um, you don't want to over-treat, you don't want to under-treat. And to find that balance is sometimes challenging, and so getting, finding, um, identifying the right prognostic factors and uh, pointing them out are important. You know, some of the things that we do know, like large cell transformation, somebody asked about, when you have this marker of inflammation that's really high, uh, called LDH, sometimes that predicts a worse prognosis. People that are older, people that have more advanced, uh, uh, highest of stages, stage four. Um, you know, this increased inflammation, whether the inflammation causes the cancer to get worse or whether the cancer is causing inflammation, it's kind of the chicken or the egg and really hard to, to tease out which one is the case. Um, but uh, it probably both things are true. <laughs> And that chronic inflammation can cause, put you at a higher risk for getting a cancer, but also having a lot of cancer causes inflammation. <laughs> um, neither situation is good. <laughs> uh, other factors, you know, the number of those tumors, we could talk about something that's called follicular tropism, where it affects the hair follicles, and sometimes people lose their hair. Sometimes those are uh, individuals that need more aggressive treatment but we need better identifiable, better tools. Um, this is an overview of all the things that are, have been used that can be used uh, in T-cell lymphoma or in continuous T-cell lymphoma to treat them. So there's a whole host of skin-directed therapies and then systemic therapies. And usually in continuous T-cell lymphoma, we move from skin-directed initially, and then when that doesn't work, we move to systemic. With the exception that if you identify a patient, that is high risk or has advanced stage of diagnosis, then we may go right to systemic therapy. Um, so that, uh, but, and I'll go through kind of a little bit about all the different, some of these different options and some of these, and I have a couple cases and we'll see if time allows. Oh, sorry, give me to pause it so you can see the picture. <laughs> and often we use both skin directed and systemic therapies together. This is kind of how we think about treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. The way that we approach and treat the disease is really mainly based on the stage. Uh, where early stage patients, this is less than 10% of your body, of your skin that's involved, get really skin-directed only therapy. Uh, as you have more involvement, or if you have these other scenarios where you're red from head to toe, if you have these tumor lesions, if you have things outside the skin in high amounts, then we think about other types of therapies, all the way from something called photophoresis to other systemic targeted drugs, uh, to sometimes even chemotherapy, to sometimes bone marrow transplant, of course clinical trial being something that we think about at all stages. Um, nitrogen and mustard, yeah. which one is that on the scale? Topical, you're talking about topical? Yes. Topical. So this is a skin-directed therapy. That's skin-directed. Yeah. Yep. So like okay. Valcolor falls over here, and it's usually something that we use for uh, kind of these earlier stage patients. But I'll say even with people that have advanced stage disease, so are over here somewhere, um, we'll often use kind of a skin adjunct sometimes. You know, I have people that are on systemic therapy. I'm an oncologist, so I sort of mostly operate in the systemic therapy world, um, less so than the phototherapy world. Uh, but we often have patients that are getting sort of uh, targeted therapy for a long period of time. They have sort of a resistant plaque, uh, um, and sometimes we'll just say, hey, let's just get rid of this or and do some sort of skin-directed therapy in addition. Uh, so the general concepts that are just, it's, I think it's easier to talk about general rules as opposed to like getting down into the weeds too much about every specific therapy. Um, but there's really not enough uh, evidence-based data to tell us that we should do certain things in certain scenarios. <laughs> um, so there's really a, a we, we develop these guidelines that we that help sort of um, uh, treating physicians um, uh, use to help to treat to help to help treat. And I mentioned this that uh, one of the goals of the is T-cell from what is do no harm. Um, you know, it's very very difficult when I have patients that that are very have a lot of problems and get very symptomatic from the treatment and are more symptomatic from the treatment they're getting than their disease, that's a problem. Um, and we try to really avoid that situation. That's what we mean by do no harm. Uh, it is important to, I mentioned uh, prior 
talk about having kind of a multidisciplinary clinic, or at least a clinic that, uh, or if you're working with an oncologist, have a dermatologist that is working well with that oncologist to be able to um, have the dermatologic, uh, uh, to treat the dermatologic aspects as well as the other so maybe systemic things that are needed. Um, so it's important to have sort of a dermatologist and an oncologist if you're in this more advanced stage disease to be able to um, kind of tackle it from two different ends. Um, you know, in, in my clinic, I work with a, a dermatologist, and she relies on, on me for a lot of things, but I also rely on her for, for plenty of things. Uh, and so it's it's important to have that kind of multi-pronged attack to really uh, balance things. Would yep. you say that it's the case that you're itchy, but what if you're not itchy, then would you still recommend seeing a dermatologist? Yeah, so I think it's at all stages, it's always useful. The way that we do it in our uh, clinic is that for people that have advanced stage disease that are needing like systemic therapies, I tend to see them a lot more. Um, and then, but every once in a while, I have my dermatologist come check on them, make sure there's not any kind of skin adjunct therapies that are needed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of like City Hope, where like Dr. Quirk will work with like Dr. Zhang to uh -huh. in conjunction. Okay. Yep. So we'll, if like in, in our case, then we'll have to just make a separate appointment to see another dermatologist. Yeah. So sometimes uh, I don't know how it is at City of Hope. I thought they had a clinic where they see people together. They do, but we're we're at UCI, so. Oh, okay. So yeah, whether whether you're seeing like I see patients in, together with a dermatologist, but you could easily do it um, where you just see a dermatologist periodically and not with the oncologist. Okay. That's okay too. Just need to make sure that there's good communication. Uh, between the two. Can you do it the other way around? Of course, and so that for early stage disease, um, I think for advanced stage disease, you really need an oncologist and need to make, especially if you're getting systemic therapy, but if you have early stage disease, or say your systemic therapy works so well that you're in remission, you don't really have much, um, then you could probably mainly be followed by a dermatologist and then maybe see the oncologist less frequently. So I always, you know, in our clinic, when I see early stage disease patients, I always tell them that they probably don't need me and unlikely to ever need me, <laughs> um, which is a good thing. People are usually happy to not see the cancer doctor. <laughs> but uh, but so I think it works both ways. Uh, but for early stage disease, you know, dermatologists are the, sort of your main go-to, whereas advanced stage disease, I think oncologists play a much bigger role. Is there a follow-up? Oh, I found that having the oncologist on the team just phenomenally helpful because the derms, you know, you get six minutes with them and the cancer guys are, they give you more time. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's crazy stuff happening and there's mm -hmm. lots of questions, it's a lot easier to get it out of your oncologist than it is out of the mm -hmm. dermatologist because the derms, <laughs> yeah. their rooms great. are filled, you know, they're ready to move on. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, whether I have blood involvement or not, just just having him having the oncologist as part of the cycle of people that you see, sure, kind of really grounds you and gives you extra time. Sure, something else can help. Yeah, I mean, even even for people that don't have blood involvement per se, or don't have, there are plenty of people that have resistant patch or plaque disease that phototherapy is not working and need systemic therapies. In which case, then you need an oncologist for sure. So it's not just the advanced stage patients per se, it's also the patients that are just resistant to topical or skin therapy. Um, important other points, things to think about, you can often reuse different therapies um, and that uh, we often observe mixed responses. So saying that like some patches and plaques will go away, some tumors will go away, and some will, um, not respond, or, and then you may need this is what, where, where it comes into play that we use, often use um, uh, combined therapies to, to approach things. Um, and then sort of optimizing this maintenance therapy um, approach, which I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, so key treatment selection, I mentioned that, you know, really, really it's a stage-based approach. Um, and that, but there are other prognostic factors that we look at, including large cell transformation and folliculotropism or folliculotropic disease. Uh, and uh, when things aren't responding uh, to, to sort of skin-directed therapy, it's 
really when it's time to think about systemic therapies. Uh, the age, comorbidities, these are all uh, things that play into, uh, play into how, what the best treatment might look like for any individual. Um, some of them, you know, they all have unique side effects and, and potential, or at least potential side effects and risks. And so to be able to balance those with whatever other medical problems you have or other medicines you might be on is really important. And then access issues, insurance issues, unfortunately those things are, are um, huge. And um, things like photophoresis is not available to everyone everywhere. Uh, total skin electron beam therapy similarly is not available in lots of places. Um, and there are lots of insurance hurdles uh, for people to come, you know, places and to see different doctors. Go ahead. In your experience, are you, well, probably not you, but I'm thinking about the insurance piece. Is there a connection between insurance barriers going down based on the patient's symptomology increasing or changing or? Yeah. Does so, that make sense what I'm trying yeah, to I say? Yeah, I think so. So I think. Do you the, see things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, that uh, insurance often these are experiences that if you convince them that there is a reason that you need to see XYZ doctor because he's an expert or she's an expert in continuous T cell lymphoma, they sometimes will let you do that. <laughs> they won't always, but they'll at least, uh, they can be convinced in, in certain scenarios if the clinical context is right. Uh, so the, the mycosis fungoidae that I, I talked about this a little bit before too, but um, it has been called kind of the greatest masquerader. I'm not sure who coined that term, but it has been called that uh, because it, it can mimic other diseases and other problems. Uh, and, and, and while and these are all sort of different subtypes of mycosis fungoides or different variations of it, how they present, and this gets at that maybe the point too that. Um, you know, just because you had kind of, um, uh, say, folliculotropic uh, involvement on the head and neck, and we got rid of that, and then years later, it could come back as something else, uh, or a different variant of mycosis fungoides. Um, so it's not always going to look the same, and that just tells you you need to buy up. It, it, it emphasizes the point that we need to be vigilant, we need to continue surveillance, we need to continue to biopsy things if things pop up that don't seem right. And people can have, um, even different types of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So we have a number of patients uh, that have mycosis fungoides and also have something called lymphomatoid papillosis. Uh, so different disorder, treated differently, um, looks a little bit different usually uh, clinically, but, but it is, um, you, know, you can have different, different subtypes throughout your lifetime. Why that is, it's a good question. When you mentioned the hair loss, you, you yeah. spoke of it as though it was a symptom as opposed to a, um, a side effect of treatment. Yeah. Is that what your intent was? To yes. So it's um, I mean, most of the therapies that we use don't cause hair loss uh, outside of like you know side other chemotherapy, you know, traditional chemotherapy, okay. which we tend, tend to not tend to not use or try to avoid. Um, so it is a symptom often of that folliculotropic subtype because it involves the hair follicles and so the hair falls out. Wow. Well, Could you go back one slide? Sure. Do we actually really have a subtype called invisible? I can't believe you put that on the slide. Yeah, that's good. You, we, we really didn't have a subtype called invisible. It's been, it's been coined before. <laughs> really? So, so how okay. would you even find out that you have that? So you just well, I mean, you have other subtypes. You'd have something else. But I think that the the the, uh, the fact that it's there is, I think, in reference to when you biopsy something and there's no discrete rash, and you just biopsy it, and it comes back as a continuous T cell lymphoma, but there's no rash, and that just kind of tells you that there's probably subclinical disease that we can't often see, but it's there. So sometimes one of the things that we run into is very challenging, um, and, and probably one of the most challenging things for me is when you treat skin, it often gets worse. And a lot of disease that maybe we didn't see before, it kind of comes out and looks a little bit worse before it gets better. So you see this with phototherapy, but you also see it with other systemic therapies as well, um, where. You know, you may not have had a rash, say right here, but then you start phototherapy and all of a sudden you get a rash there. 
And that's really because you had disease that was there that just wasn't enough disease really to make it visible to us. Um, but it's a challenging... So you really would send somebody out of your office with a, with a diagnosis of invisible mycosis fungoides? No, we, we would just write it. This, these are all kind of sub sub categories and not things that are just more descriptions of it. Yeah. On the folliculotropic uh, head and neck, is it only head and neck? Oh. It's usually, but it could be other. I mean, it's usually where you have more hair. Can you stage it? Stage the same way. I, did I say that well? If you if you didn't, and now you do, what he said, would you say something? You know, oh, you're still in stage one or stage two? Or <coughs> stage three. Is it because you stage the tumors and mm -hmm. cover and you stage that? Yeah. I'm wondering because for my life, my barber started telling me about a year ago. Oh yeah. You're losing your hair. Yeah. And for four generations of my family, no one loses hair. Yeah. And I thought, oh. and I said, oh. and, I, and I just wrote it off as, oh, I treated topically yeah. with nitrogen mustard for many years, and I just assumed that yeah. it's probably catching up with me. But then you said this today, and I said, did he say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it's a uh, that's an interesting story. I mean, we. You know, when you have this uh, variant, this where it's affecting the hair follicles, it makes your hair make, make your hair fall out. Uh, it's really depending on how much of your body that's involved, it would still be could still be early stage disease. A lot of my body was involved initially when I went to. Oh, that to the, it's really, I these would. are all these don't impact how we stage it necessarily, okay. just kind of exactly. how we describe it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you nailed it. Um, so we often use combination therapies, and this is it's a there's a lot of um, mixed responses uh, that we see, and so sometimes starting one therapy and maybe having some response in one area, but should have an area that's that's resistant, we may want to add a skin directed therapy to a systemic therapy, um, like you could add uh, a retinoid like targretin with phototherapy, and that we think that those might apply some synergistic. Uh, um, therapy together, you can do other things, and, you know, the whole sort of gamut of different things. Uh, but often that's a common scenario. Sometimes we can use systemic, multiple systemic therapies together. Uh, again, you know, emphasizing the point of trying to do no harm, and that uh, depending on the patient or the individual, you don't want to, if someone has a really minimal amount of disease, even though it's resistant to phototherapy, um, if they're relatively not that symptomatic, you're pro probably not going to want to just all of a sudden add two drugs that may cause side effects. Probably start stepwise and see how one goes. Uh, but if somebody's very symptomatic, um, say for the example of like someone with uh, a good amount of uh, sort of higher amount of blood involvement, you, know, you may want to start photophoresis and something at the same time, um, just as, a, as an example. So these are the newest drugs that we have out there, so I'll just kind of, uh, I used to have a picture of new kids on the block, and a couple of Asians, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, this is the uh, Alcanza study that uh, was looking at a drug called Brentuximab, Medotin, um, which is a, targets a marker called CD30 that's on some mycosis fungoides, uh, in comparison to methotrexate or targretin. So it was up to the a provider to be able to choose whether they want to use methotrexate or targretin. They're randomized to either one of those arms. Um, these are kind of just all the inclusion criteria. Basically, it's CD30 positive mycosis fungoides, which is in the trial was um, required to have more than 10 percent expression of CD30. And then the other other variants that are uniformly CD30 positive, like the anaplastic large cell lymphomas, um, and it just randomized to one of these two arms. Rentuximab is a uh, IV therapy, so it's given in the veins. Uh, these other drugs are oral drugs. No worry. Uh, and this is just the overall summary slide of kind of what the trial showed. Uh, basically, Rentuximab and Pidotin is reasonably safe and tolerable. Um, there are very expected side effects that you should be wary of, uh, mainly neuropathy, uh, sort of numbness, tingling in the fingers and toes that you need to adjust the doses for, and too often, People 
uh, don't don't be too uh, don't be too macho and try to not tell people about neuropathy and tell your doctor about neuropathy until it's uh, until you can't walk and <laughs> even notify them beforehand. Um, and uh, basically, obertuximab is better uh, essentially at all endpoints and better response overall response rate, uh, better complete response rate with CR. Uh, and better progression-free survival, and they stay on the drug for longer. <clears throat> and that important, uh, they assessed quality of life measures and was better in the brintuximab arm as well. So these are all, this is applicable to people that had failed one line of therapy already, um, but basically showing that brintuximab is better than methotrexate and targretin. Uh, this is just a, a patient that had a um, you know, nice response, uh, this is a patient with large cell transformation. So uh, this is a patient with very advanced stage disease. Uh, both of them responded very well to, to therapy and um, got a near, a near remission, but um, uh, excellent response. However, you know this is not a curative therapy. These responses are not long-lasting. Um, I guess depending on how you define long-lasting. But uh, one of the things that this gets to, one of the things we think about is like how would the role of maybe switching to like other kind of maintenance therapy after you've got the best response from this drug. And that's something that we try to do. Yeah. 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 Can I say, um, well, I'm, I'm on the PCALCL side of things or ALCL side of things. And how long does it take the um, uh, brintuximab to, to show a result on the skin? Yeah. Sorry, um, Usually a couple, so I think that the median time to response uh, is around six, 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 so six weeks or so, six to nine weeks, so it's uh, usually a couple doses that you've, you know, sort of had a response. There are people that it takes a little bit longer. I'll say usually people, usually people get to their best response, sort of their maximal response, after around six doses. So it doesn't. So for us, what we're sort of starting to think about is maybe how do we get people to their best response, and then think about maybe switching therapy, or if they're in complete remission, maybe stopping, and then restarting if it comes back. Uh, most people aren't getting in a complete remission. Most people are getting partial remission. So um, most people that we run into want when we stop it want to do something else because they still have some skin. Is there a common name for this drug? Uh, uh, Brentuximab. This is sort of um, uh, citrus. Thank you. I was blanking on the other name. Etcetris is the other name. What's the other name? Uh, so Brentuximab or Etcetris. It's A D C E T R I S. I don't know if that's any easier. Um, so, so this is a, another uh, new study too with a drug called Modemoluzumab, um, and this is a study that randomized uh, patients and compared them uh, to the, this drug, uh, which is another IV drug and drug of the veins, to drug to varinostat, which is a different oral drug that, that's used, and um, this uh, study just kind of in summary. Uh, does appear safe to use this drug, mogobolizumab, uh, even with really long-term usage of the drug, so it doesn't appear to have kind of a cumulative toxicity like the brentuximab drug does. Uh, there are people that have been on this for, you know, year, I guess at this point, uh, probably a couple of years, uh, but certainly more than a year, and have tolerated it. There doesn't seem to be additional side effects that come up. All the toxicities or things that we know tend to happen early for the most part. Um, but it was better in comparison to Varinostat um, at really most responses, at most, uh, at looking at most uh, endpoints. Uh, so the overall response rate was 28% compared to 5% in the Varinostat arm. Uh, this trial did have a pretty tight criteria what they defined as a response, because you had to have more than 50% response in the skin. Uh, and the duration of response was pretty good, 13 months. Uh, much higher than what Varinostat arm was, which I didn't write there. I think it was like four, four, four months maybe. Uh, and patients with blood involvement um, actually seem to benefit and have better, higher response rates. So uh, this is something you know I mentioned that there, there we may learn down the road. Again, we don't know this yet, but we may learn that 
patients with small amounts of blood involvement that we can detect, this may be a better drug for them. But it, this really is talking about high levels of blood involvement that at least we know right now. Uh, so Question? Yep. What, what does duration of response mean? Does that mean after you're done with the therapy that you're in remission for 13 months? So it's an ongoing therapy, so you continue to get the therapy. So it's given initially five weeks in a row and then every other week. Uh, but duration of response means how long they stayed on the drug until it stopped working or they had some other issue. Make sense? Yeah. Did people ever go on once a month instead of every week or every two weeks? Yeah, there's some data out there on people going to less frequent dosing. Um, it's kind of still early on in terms of um, people do that in continuous T-cell lymphoma or off to take drugs that are designed to give uh, you know, three time, two or three times a, a month and then eventually transition to less frequent dosing. Um, it's, uh, so they're starting to, we're starting to think that that might be an okay thing to do. <laughs> and we do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know how much uh, I don't know what time I, what time do I have to? How about five to What's that? About five to twelve. Yeah, about ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have some cases. I don't know if there are questions. I'm happy to just answer questions. If there are more questions, I can maybe answer questions, or I can just dive into a few some cases that I have. Does anybody have any questions? Can treatment reverse the hair loss? What's that? Can <laughs> <laughs> treatment reverse the hair loss? Yeah, well, that, when I come up with a. I can get rid of a uh, hair loss and have better no, therapies for healthy hair. Oh, yeah. Well, I think as far as the hair loss goes, um, when you manage the disease, okay. oftentimes your hair does grow back. Yep. Oh. So, yeah, you know, when you, yeah. yep. particularly follicular trophic disease, like Bexeritine and Puva together, a lot of people will grow back hair, mm -hmm. as well as some of the systemic therapies. So, oh, okay. yep. there's hope. There's hope. There's hope for your oh, hair. There's hope for your hair. If you already had hair loss to be here, you know, I, <laughs> I did. That's so that's I didn't have hair loss. I had a question related to why should the patient do flow cytometry versus oh. gene rearrangement? Um, so it, uh, they're just different, sort of the different tests. Uh, the gene rearrangement, you're talking about blood, I think, specifically. Yes. Um, but the gene rearrangement studies on blood is just a more sensitive way to, to look for small amounts of disease that the flow cytometry <coughs> might not pick up. Uh, gene rearrangement is not very quantitative either. Yeah. So if you're looking for the amount of disease in the blood, uh, the flow cytometry, especially if they can identify the tumor cells uh, by the way they look in the flow, can give you a better idea of is there a little bit, is there yep. a lot, or how is it changing with treatment? Um, where gene rearrangement is more plus minus. Is there cells there or is there not? Although there are getting some newer techniques that can look very sensitively. The question is, is, is that helpful in managing your disease? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, coming back to the, uh, the inflammation and, and whether there's either a correlation or a causal effect of the disease with respect to inflammation or inflammation mm -hmm. with respect to the disease. Um, do we have any information on that? Is that looked at very much? Uh, because my suspicion is the more systemic inflammation you have, the more likely you're going to have the presentation of this disease. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the, you know, we do know that inflammation is kind of a, having chronic inflammation in any way is, is potentially a risk factor for getting any kind of cancer. Um, there are lots of people that have um, eczema, for example, that's a, or some other kind of chronic dermatitis, and then they end up getting cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, I, I would say there's not really a clear-cut causal uh, association, at least my by uh, from studies I've seen, but I, th I think that most people would probably uh, think that there might be some sort of link there. I don't know. I mean, some of our treatments are actually inducing inflammation. So the interferon is what the body does when a virus infects the body. Mm -hmm. And we use that uh, medically to try to get the disease to go away, sometimes by itself or in conjunction with targretin, photophoresis, or things like that. 
there's anecdotal evidence that there are uh, people who, uh, we see it go both ways. Some people, when they have some another inflammatory event going on, the disease gets worse, and then we actually have some cases uh, where I've had a patient who had horrendous, uh, uh, the skin's a barrier to uh, infection, and they got the infection on their heart valve, and uh, mm. got very, very sick from that, but her CTCO went away. Mm. And so, so we mm. can see it different ways, depending on how the inflammation is affecting uh, the, the immune system. So sometimes we induce inflammation to, uh, to help get rid of the cancer cells, because mm. uh, the inflammation may be directed that way if you're using it in conjunction with other treatments but it also can be a hindrance because we do think the immune system is very important in, in, in moderating that disease. So it's always hard to know should you take anti-inflammatory agents or you should be taking immune boosters. <laughs> hard to say in a general category. Yeah, yeah there's, there's um, lots of uh, cases and data to show too that how some certain people can get bad skin infections from like staph and that's the first time that their disease declared itself after that. Uh, and we think that the actual staff probably is the trigger that maybe you um, made it start. So that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Um, do you have another question over there? Yeah, I was just curious, um, <clears throat> because I mean, we're in the aggressive group, and looking at systemic um, therapies, what's coming down the pipe? I mean, as far as being a class of Yeah, so <clears throat> let me just go, I got a, these are slides, so I was just going to mention sort of total skin electron beam therapy is an option for folks, and then I have uh, uh, various scenarios, but I'll just jump to the kind of investigation stuff. I uh, just have a couple slides on sort of what uh, is out there in terms of, now this is really for all T-cell lymphomas, but gener generally could potentially be applicable to cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphomas. So there are different uh, sort of broad categories of different types of therapies. So we think about like targeted therapy, you can have targeted therapy from like antibodies or antibody like a brentuximab, which is an antibody that's targeting CD30. Um, there are other antibodies that are sort of targeting various markers on the surface of the cells. Um, there are also various different, it's almost more of like a kind of souped up antibody therapy in that cellular therapy and taking sort of your own T cells and CAR T cells to then target sort of certain markers on the cells. Some of the challenges uh, with targeting uh, different markers on the surface of the, the cutaneous uh, of the T cell lymphoma cell is that those same markers are on your normal T cells, and so if you try to to say target like CD4, which is a universally positive on all cutaneous T cell lymphoma, you're going to get rid of all your CD4 positive cells, and that's what AIDS is when you have no CD4 T cells in your body. Um, so I think you know there are lots of we don't want to do that, and again, do no harm. But there are ways that we might be able to turn these things on and off, and um, so that's an interesting uh, uh, modality of therapy, and this is broadly called cellular therapy. Um, there are other drugs that are uh, targeted, and I think that the next slide here is on other a whole list of different different types of different agents that have different targets that kind of target more within the cell uh, and the way that the cell functions. Uh, microRNA is a, a newer target. Um, microRNA 155 is a new drug that's out there that, that we're targeting in CTCL. There's an ongoing large study um, it's, uh, that, that's trying to see if this is better than the standard of care for more focusing on um, a kind of middle, earlier stage patients, not the most advanced, aggressive stage patients. But, um, there are other drugs kind of to answer the question about immune modulating drugs and how the immune system factors. We know that the immune system can fight cancer, um, so how we can kind of soup up the immune system to go fight cancer in the form of drugs called checkpoint inhibitors is something that's out there and being investigated. There's another drug that kind of stimulates a different kind of cell um, to kind of try to uh, get rid of the, uh, uh, the cancer cell um, that's at anti-C47. Um, there are drugs, a um, couple of spots up, called epigenetic drugs that really try to change the way that the, the DNA is, uh, what the, or try to change the um, way that the cancer cells sort of replicating and dividing and see if you can change that in a certain way and make it go away. Um, so these are, these are all the targeted therapies, at least some of, um, not all of them, but, uh, at least some of the ones that are out there and a little bit, at least in clinical 
suicidal um, and uh, different stages of development uh, for various various types of T cell lymphomas. Um, so these are all kind of more targeted specific therapies. And then of course we're trying to combine therapies, um, maybe targeted therapy and a cellular therapy, targeted therapy and a uh, a immune modulatory drug, which we've been doing, you know, interferon, like you said before, is a uh, stimulates the immune system, um, and so it's an immune modulatory drug uh, that we've been using for a long time, and uh, trying to find what the right combination is, is is a goal for certain. When you use the words under investigation, does that mean they're in a clinical trial or they're uh, currently available with FDA approval? Yeah, I think all of these are on clinical trials. Or have different or have or indication. Yeah. Or have to indicate yeah, or have indications for different diseases that uh, but all in all in investigation in clinical trial for continuous T cell phone. Any questions? I hear a lot about CAR T. Uh -huh. Is that one that will eventually get on this list for us? Maybe. <laughs> um, so CAR-T is really exciting therapy in B-cell lymphomas, uh, mainly because you can live without B-cells, <laughs> at least pretty well. Uh, so CAR-T targets a marker uh, called CD19, so it's getting rid of the cancer cells that are CD19 positive, but also getting rid of all of your normal B-cells that are CD19 positive. You cannot do that in T-cell lymphomas. Um, so the, the trick is to either find a way to target a unique marker, um, maybe CD30, for example, might be an effective therapy for some cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Um, or find ways to be able to manipulate that, that CAR T to turn it on or off, or have some other way to have, your, to have normal T cells after giving that therapy. Um, so there are lots of uh, challenges. <laughs> so, if you, so the B cells that we have, we, we want to keep them if they're not bad, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but if you get a CAR T cell for a B cell lymphoma, and at least you're, you're not going to have any B cells, malignant or normal, for a while. And you can live without B cells? For a while. We cannot live without T cells? Correct. Okay. And there are ways we can we give people okay. antibodies. B cells make antibodies, so we give people antibodies often after CAR T for B cell lymphomas. But the NIH is doing a study currently on CD30 targeted. Correct. Correct. Um, that's a, what's a, it's more than just the NIH, but there's a right. CD30 card in Houston and North Carolina and the NIH. But um, but there are other plenty. Of, there are clinical trials. There's a CD4 card T cell out there. Um, there's uh, in Baylor. There's a CD5 and 7 CAR T. Um, so there are. I mean, there's, there's not that it's not being done. It just has its own set of challenges and risks. And do no harm. <laughs> Can I need to give a like, couple minute warning, and if there's time maybe for one more question, but anyone that is going to be um, coming back after lunch for the aggressive will be in this room. The early stage will be in the peninsula room, and down the hall is the driftwood rest for family caregivers. So as soon as we're done in here in a few minutes, you will go right out here. I'm sure you saw the tables being set up with the food. Grab your food and then go to bring it right back. Like I said, if you're going to be in the aggressive, just come right back here with your plate of food. And uh, like I said, the other ones are down the hall, okay? Okay, yes, that's right. How do you approach stem cell therapy? <laughs> so, I, uh, it's a good question. I had some, some slides in there about the transplant. I think for people that um, are younger, uh, that have that treatment, uh, have a disease that's resistant to at least one, two systemic therapies. I think if you think about it, I think there's better data in the Cesare patients um, than probably the other, you know, just kind of recalcitrant MF patients that, that are failing several, uh, failing a line or two of therapy. But I think in a young patient that's starting on systemic therapy and that's not responding to a couple lines of therapy, uh, certainly, it's reasonable to think about. I don't know. Usually, my if it's someone that's young enough and they're you know say they go to a uh, uh, if they fail two systemic lines of therapy, say like failed ramadepsin and brentuximab, would at least sort of think about it, and start having a discussion. I don't 
know that I don't know that the I don't know it's unclear you know, where exactly the role is. I think in a patient with you know very uh, high level of sensory disease, I think if you give them a remission, we should probably think about it. Um, but in people with uh, lower level disease, I don't know that it's necessarily the case. The, the websites and people that are on the website seem to talk about Stanford as a place to do that. And Dr. Kim's name is often mentioned as one of the leaders in that kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah, uh, so Dr. Kim has, uh, you know, they've developed an approach that they use for people with mycosis phongoides. Um, I would say all transplant centers in the U.S. So they transplant a couple of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma patients a year. She's certainly done, they've probably done the most. Is that a risky surgery? Um, so it's a, uh, is it risky? It has a lot of uh, potential risk, which is why we save it. Um, you know, even best estimates in you know, 2019, um, best patient, there's probably at least a 15% chance of, sort of dying from the transplant. So I think you know, that's a fair amount of risk that's involved. Uh, and there's potential uh, long-term risk as well uh, in the form of something called chronic graft-versus-host disease. So really, I mean, uh, there are different ways to maybe try to minimize that risk, but at best, there's still a 15% chance of dying from something we're doing, uh, which is a fair risk. Uh, so we try only to choose people that would have a higher risk of that, <laughs> of, of uh, the disease causing and, and two of the important points with transplant is the better the match, the better you do. Um, so sibling matches um, do better. And then being in remission, if you transplant somebody who's not in complete remission, you know, those lymphoma cells quickly come back. So being in a, a what's declared complete remission is really yeah, important.